So, uh, yeah, hello. Good. All right. Hello, good day, good evening to our first, the second first lecture of uh, psych, uh, Psyches in turmoil and it's already become a tradition that we hand the floor now to our interpreting collective enterprise who still support us by interpreting maybe some people are new today who have not heard this little introduction so the floor is yours enterprise is a collective of people with interpreting experience from leipzig it is our goal to support groups and initiatives that oppose political, social, or cultural power structures by supporting them with realizing interpretation at their events. We also want to raise awareness about the importance of interpreting. Language is not only a tool for communication, it is inherently political. Language creates reality. It reflects and reproduces power structures. It creates or overcomes barriers depending on how we use it. Likewise, we want to give language mediation a face by being present as an initiative with its own political objective. Interpretation is not a service provided by machines. To everyone com contributing tonight, please speak slowly and clearly. You are being interpreted. Please do so, especially when reading anything pre-scripted out loud. Also questions in the chat, for example. Please announce the language you are going to choose before you start contributing. This is to avoid chaos with the interpreting text, since interpreters need to change channels depending on the language spoken on the floor. If we feel the need to interrupt the event because issues with tick or the interpretation arise, we will do so via the floor or if this not, is not possible via tonight's facilitation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will be speaking German. And I did make sure that I will speak slowly today and wrote a reminder to myself, so I am not the pain to the interpreters. Very welcome, very warm welcome. Good morning, good day, good evening to the second run of the first version, the first series in this uh, series of talks, Vulnerability and Fear, a Revolution Against Life. In the name of the organizers, the Institute for Social Research, the Institute for Human Geography and Medical International. And I give a very warm welcome to our speakers tonight, Mpuni Sondi and Usha Merck. And I send warm greetings to the space somewhere between Argentina and Brazil to Rita Zagato, who intended to be here with us tonight, but is now on a flight to be able to be vaccinated. And, but we have we we were able to um, interview her last night, so which we've recorded. So we'll be able to include ideas and thoughts of her during this event. I'm Julia Manek, the psychosocial lecturer in part of the public relations in Medical International, and together with Lucian Kirschbaum, who will facilitate the chat today, we uh, will lead the session tonight. So in this session, in chronological order, we wanted to start looking at the pandemic social, social psychology, psychosocial events who are accompanied by effects and social struggles. We start with effects of fear and vulnerability or Put differently, fear and which. So the world pandemic was able to spread, not least because the majority of the world population is being denied and are deprived of the protection and security. So the prolifer proliferation of neoliberalism was likewise coup against life, and the existing systems for the protection and solidarity were ultimately undermined. So we are looking at what how has the pandemic affected all of us and how have have everyone in a certain respect been made more equal but how has everyone how have the inequalities be exaggerated exacerbated by the pandemic at the same time 
So the demarcation, the demarcation lines and between inequalities in this poly pandemic and without any historic breaks regarding racism, exploitation, marginalization of poor people, denial of access to vaccinations in poor countries and the exacerbation of violence against women and queers. So the pandemic and our shock regarding our own vulnerability shows different aspects of fear and how we deal with it. So for example, in Germany, the empty shelves in supermarkets, it does not only show how we're afraid of our own vulnerability, but also it shows the power to purchase of a certain part of the population. We have always heard of fear being reported in a threefold mortal fear, not only, especially if the lockdown supposed to save lives instead represented a mortal danger to others because they now faced hunger or femicidal violence. Of course, the pandemic has not only highlighted the vulnerability of bodies themselves, but also the vulnerability of life itself on this planet as also manifests itself in climate change. In order to explore these fears and the related effects and social dynamics, we have invited our two speakers, Mpumi and Rita. So we would like to ask how the revolution against life has affected your work, how fear and social dynamics are linked to the pandemic. Mpumi, I'm very happy that you took the time um, or made time because in South Africa you are on holidays right now. So thanks very much for being here tonight and discussing with us. Since over 25 years, you have been working with people who experience extreme marginalization, discrimination and violence. You are a social worker, a therapeut, uh, therapist and the clinical director of Sophia Town Community, Community Psychological Services in Johannesburg, South Africa. Sophia Town is an unusually engaged organization which does not perceive psychosocial support as a luxury good and does not want to limit it to an insecure middle class, however, to enable access to an empathetic witnessship to those who witness structural violence day in, day out. And you have also worked with and support the carers themselves who may come from marginalized backgrounds and have experienced similar violence. I am inspired by you again and again whenever I have the opportunity to listen to you and see what experiences, analysis and research you have been done regarding aspects of fear during the pandemic. You are um, going to report about this uh, in a bit. I would like to explain why Rita is not able to be with us here tonight. So this is why I would like to screen a small video snippet of the interview last night, which in which she will explain why she cannot be with us at the moment. And afterwards, I would like to pass the word to Mpuni and Usher for the discussion to start. And after the uh, formal discussion and input, we would like to open an experimental space and see whether we will be able to manage um, to include some video clips and ideas of Rita's. And Mhuni and Usha uh, will manage to react to those snippets. So Rita Segato, maybe some of you don't know her, is an Argentinian anthropologist, one of the most influential post post-colonial thinkers and intellectuals. And with her contribution, the deconstruction of the world in February set a founding stone for this series of lectures. Uh, 
also regarding that the modern subject, especially the white a rich heterosexual man has had to realize its own vulnerability and mortality. So these are thoughts from which this series of lectures developed. And just as her academic work, her activism, and the way she's perceived um, and the, have coined this lecture series. The feminist connective in Chile, as thesis, uh, which we have mentioned during the last session, the rapist are you. So the performance I mentioned also included ideas of Rita's. Her long-term activistic work uh, together with, ma with marginalized women and other activists topicalizes the deadly particle exploitation many people face. So now imagine Rita is with us here tonight. Uh, to Rita, thank you very much for your ideas. They are very emblematic for this series of lectures. Hopefully you can see my screen and I will pass the word to Rita. Exactly. What the pandemic is currently doing to me. Yes, I'll explain that with pleasure. But I have to bear in mind that my case is one of millions of cases in which the pandemic is causing a headache in a wide variety of ways. My situation is as follows. Uh, 2019, already I had committed to giving a seminar on decolonial feminism and coloniality of power at the University of Princeton. So in the first year of the pandemic in 2020, due to the pandemic, I could not travel. Now travel is possible generally, and it will be possible to hold the seminar face to face. But in Argentina, I did get the Sputnik vaccine. And with that vaccination, it is impossible to enter the USA. So I wrote to all my friends who live all over the world to find out if somewhere I could get a Johnson Johnson vaccination. Finally, I found a solution in Fosdi Iguazu, where I had been living, where a batch of Johnson Johnson had arrived. So my colleagues and friends wrote to me. So all of them are women. We are a network of women who support each other mutually. And they wrote to me, we have a batch of Johnson Johnson vaccination. So I had to leave the small village of Kilkara, where I live here in the um, gorge of Humahuaca, near the border with Chile in Bolivia in the northwest of Argentina. I had to go to Salta, uh, or I will go to Salta, the capital of the bordering province. From this town, there is a direct flight to Puerto Iguazu, from which place I will cross the border by land to get to Brazil, to Foz do Iguazu, where I will get vaccinated the day of my arrival, just to go back the day after. Eine Impfung, sie um, wird mit Johnson und uh, Johnson hoffentlich geimpft in einem kleinen so, Ort in Brasilien und dann ein Seminar. Peter, hopefully be vaccinated to hold a seminar in the USA. So following my, uh, my demand or uh, me asking her to show, uh, explain some of the privileges that can be made visible in this current situation where people uh, are being limited or restricted or not to use their freedom of movement. Um, she did start to um, highlight some points that 
her situation, her current situation shows us about the pandemic. en tiempo récord, o sea, muy rápidamente, implica el tener recursos disponibles para hacerlo, sin duda. Si no los tuviera, sería absolutamente imposible. Mm. Eh, entonces, así como eso, vemos la... Para mí la pandemia, como he dicho en algunas oportunidades, de la forma en que vivimos, o sea, it's starting. The pandemic leads the fragility uh, of the way we live to reveal itself. So it reveals our fragility and vulnerability. So that is why I'm saying it functions a bit like a scanner. So the pandemic shows where there are shortcomings. It makes things visible. That's quite complex because it leads to insecurity. For us Europeans, or for you Europeans, this is even more essential because you tend to strive for security and to make plans to your love plans and accuracy and security and the pandemic shows us that this is neither possible nor human this means it is essential to respect time again respecting time means accepting uncertainty And so the pandemic managed to shake us and raise our awareness of the unpredictable nature of time. I am using the word time, but we could also speak of events or what happens or could happen. The time is a commodity. It can be bought and sold. The pandemic is like an environment created to sell us the idea of control. So control over time and over life. And this message that everything's under control collapsed and it failed. And that's very important because up until then, we had been told and taught that certain changes in business seemed impossible and suddenly they are possible. So normally they are told to be impossible because um, they are under the control of the laws of capital that create the rules for our life together. So suddenly we have a pandemic and everything is changeable. And suddenly international flights are being cancelled. There's no more access to fuel, everything that seemed immovable. So regulated working hours, everything like that was changed. And most of all, the rules of, of the economy that normally, um, that normally shapes our life and we can produce, we can sell, we can buy. And none of, in that system, none of the things seemed possible to be changed. And suddenly a group of political decision makers just shift some settings and make this changes which is something good about this catastrophe many thanks to you Peter. so we would like to include this um, perspective into our discussion so 
how subjectivity is being changed, that capitalism is not a natural condition, that it could be stopped to include this brief notion of hope that Rita mentioned, because in the last sessions, it became clear that it is difficult to include hopeful perspectives and perspectives of resistance. So after this short and refreshing um, intermission, I want to give the floor to Ushe and Mpumi. Mpumi I've known for a year now and Ushe and um, Mpumi have uh, worked together for a very long time. So hello, it's me again. I'm so extremely glad to see you here today, Pumi. Unfortunately, digital only, but I have had the possibility to South Africa and to go to South Africa. And I was just short, we had almost arrived at a lunch together and then Omicron arrived and I had to change plans and go back to Germany. So. Uh, unpredictability is everywhere. So at mm. least since the pandemic, we have been in contact digitally quite regularly and with other 25 other therapists and practitioners between Latin America, Africa, uh, Europe and the Middle East. And we exchange concepts, ideas, and but also our fear, our grief our anger about what's happening in the world at the moment and that is a political project of the deprivatization of of sorrow which led to today's lecture so your observations um and what the pandemic does to people and what you have been observing um is what you will be telling us about now and the, the floor is yours Thank you very much, um, Ushe and Julia, um, for giving me this opportunity. And good evening to everyone who has managed to um, um, be with us again after uh, the November 8th challenges. Um, I was just thinking that today in South Africa, we are supposed to be celebrating our human, I mean, our day of reconciliation. It is a public holiday, it's a national holiday. And I've been thinking that um, our struggles uh, as a people in, in reconciling with each other um, has to do with our fears of, of, of opening ourselves to getting to know in classes and, 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 in, and in all our differences. But I was also thinking that the pandemic itself, sometimes the fears that we have, we have experienced uh, are also, you know, all our fears are normal. All our fears are, uh, are okay. But sometimes I think that the fears that we have also experienced uh, it's also fears at different levels of the pandemic. Uh, at the moment, we are, as a, as a nation, also struggling with fears around uh, the, the fourth wave, but also fears around um, making sure that we, we are vaccinated. There are people who would rather create stories and all sorts of... Uh, uh, theories just because they are not able to to name and claim and and talk about their fears. So when I was asked to talk about um, the fear dynamics uh, and the impact of of, of the pan pandemic, I, I I I thought about it in from the angle of being of of working with women, marginalized women. And my observation and our observations and our um, experiences um, in, in, in working in psychosocial spaces with women, but also our own experiences, um, because we were in it together. We were not looking outside and saying our clients are experiencing this and we are not experiencing it. So I first thought that um, as women, uh, 
both women that we work with and generally women in this country, we live with fear every day, even before the pandemic. Fears of, 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 of murder, fears of being raped, fears of domestic violence, uh, fears of being harassed in work situations. And so when the pandemic came, uh, I was thinking that it, 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 it brought this fear of this silent invisible killer to a people who are often, or to women who are often aware of, their, um, of, of the person who has got a potential um, of, 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 of harming them. So there was that fear of this invisible killer and a virus that at first was interpreted or, or understood, especially uh, in, in, in places where we work as a virus that only affected the rich people who could afford to travel. So at first it was about that, you know, people were saying we don't travel, so um, this wouldn't, uh, you know, affect us. But as, as, as people were getting increasingly sick, especially in townships and communities where we work in, and people were dying and funerals were increasing, we became aware that um, women are much more at risk of contracting the virus because they are in, in jobs um, where they must care for another person. Even in, 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 at home, they need to be caring for another person. So there was a lot of fears around what if I am caring for my, uh, my, my, my aunt or I am in a working, working environment where I must care for another person and then I contract this virus. But where it, it, it really became hard was when the government then uh, put us on a, um, a stay-at-home order, which here in South Africa we call it a, a, a lockdown, and everything had to stop. So the fear of, of, of poor women of being stuck at home and not, not being able to go out and, and fend for their children, to go out and find something for their children to eat, that fear was so disabling because it was clear that no one was allowed to move. And it felt as if um, the, the marginalized would be most affected because they are the people who didn't have money to go or the privilege of going to buy uh, in bulk or to panic buy. So they were stuck at home and they couldn't go and do, you know, the usual, what we call hustling, the usual that I'm going to sell these, I'm going to uh, try and sell vegetables at a street corner. Everything had to stop and, and the fear, the fears of the women that I or that we work with were not necessarily about their own death, but what would happen to my children when I die, uh, because there is also a lot of, of, of single women's households, households that are being led by women because men have simply abandoned them with children. And then there was the added fear of their children losing out at school because school wasn't happening. And once again, whenever there is a crisis, the, a crisis simply divides people even more that those that um, had the privilege and, and, and had, had resources could easily adapt the, themselves into online schooling for their kids. But uh, women that we work with didn't have such resources. So one could clearly see that their kids are just stuck. Everyone was stuck, you know, they, they couldn't um, do anything about their, their, their children's um, education. The other point I want to make before I pause, Ushe, you can also tell me if you want to come in or do you want me to just carry on until the end, is that women um, are also, most women that we work with are 
are in jobs uh, that are informal, they are in informal employment, they are in, in sectors that were hardest hit by the pandemic, uh, sectors such as uh, domestic employment, uh, they're in informal in catering businesses, those you know who, who have some, some 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 ways of feeding their own families. Some would be cooking um, outside stadiums when the soccer soccer matches outside construction sites, making lunch and people buy from them. And also, of course, those who are selling fruits and vegetables. Um, and those were the hardest hit um, uh, uh, industries or, or, or uh, environments. And they, their biggest fear and anxiety was, uh, how am I going to feed my children? And, and, and they felt alone and abandoned. And during that time, we could only call our clients because we were not allowed to see them. Um, and, and there was a lot of desperation. There was a lot of fear of um, uh, having lost their livelihoods and their income. And the next fear was that we are just going to, to, to die of hunger. And, and my kids, it, it was around the, 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 the care of, of, of their children. So that was another fear that we, we saw. The, the third fear that we, 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 we picked up was the fear of being stuck in at home with an abuser um, or the fear of not being able to run away from an abusive partner or an abusive husband. Um, and, and, and that was quite scary because they were... I, isolated, people were isolated and they didn't have any form of escape um, from the, the, the was abusive. And we also picked up a few, um, a, this increased anxiety with, with some women almost suicidal. Uh, I personally had a, a care worker who was um, in such a desperate situation. I remember spending a week with her via WhatsApp and over the phone, just trying to, to manage and assess the risk of her um, committing suicide because she was just so desperate, stuck with this abusive man in the house and she couldn't go anywhere and she couldn't access any other services. And she was a community health care worker. So they were they continued to work. She was not out of a job. She could go to work during the day to the clinic and come back home, but it was just unbearable uh, for her. Then the last fear, um, just in summary, was that of the soldiers uh, that, were, that were tasked to enforce lockdown regulations in our, in our communities. That had a lot of triggers for, 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 for people, uh, for some South African women and men, but mostly we work with women, the, the trigger was the reminder of the apartheid government, um, uh, military and police brutality, because some of the soldiers that were tasked to enforce the lockdown regulations, um, were doing things in a very harsh way. And people just uh, went back there. And one realized that there are a lot of um, uh, past traumas that haven't been healed, that came, came back. Um, and, and, and women from other African countries uh, would also have experienced the trauma uh, in their own countries. Uh, women that we work with of, of, of police and, 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 and soldier um, violence and, and, and harassment. So that all came, came, came up um, in, 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 in those telephonic counseling. And when we started opening a, a little bit, when we were allowed to see a few clients, that also was very scary. 
very traumatic and it was linked to what had happened uh, in the past uh, during the apartheid era. So those were the main uh, fears that I, I, I summed up from our experiences. I'm sure that um, if we had more time, I would go into the others. Um, and, and, and then the, 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 the dynamics that came up, of course, the first and most important one, it was the inequalities of, of our South African society. It was highlighted, uh, it was in our faces. If we had uh, ignored it previously or pretended that it's not there, it was just there, you know, you could, you could just see it. The government came up with uh, other strategies to, to, for, for people who didn't have an income to apply um, uh, for grants, for, for, for COVID-19 grants, but they were also marked by a lot of controversy. So the, the women and children uh, became the face of, of, of this inequality that we couldn't ignore anymore. The xenophobic attitudes uh, of our society and public institutions were also highlighted um, and, 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 and brought, brought about by this pandemic. Um, and, 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 and also the, 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 the failing South African economy, uh, because even before the pandemic, uh, we were already plunged into a, third, into a third recession since our democratic government. So things were just uh, getting worse with even support systems of, of, of clients that we work with losing their jobs and there being no one that is uh, working in, an, in a household. Um, and so as a psychosocial support organization, we were also struggling with our own fears that uh, we don't have what it takes to feed people or to help people with social relief because we are not that kind of an organization, but with clients and uh, who, who have gen that we have journeyed with for a long time, we would try whatever that we could and with other donations that we received to support. But we were also fear of, fearful of losing our core business, you know, that our core business is to support people psychologically. And every time we are in contact with our clients, they tell us one thing, they, they are just uh, desperate. And, and it, it would work on you when you have dropped the call or when you have stopped, uh, 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 ended talking to them, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to be at peace because you are so, um, you're feeling helpless and, 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 it, and inadequate. And it pointed back into the dysfunctional uh, and the failing economy of our country. The other thing that was highlighted was our dysfunctional state or almost dysfunctional state, if it is not already dysfunctional. A weak education system, a healthcare system uh, that is also not working as it's supposed to be, um, social services, um, land and, 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 and housing and sanitation failures. I mean, one of the things that people complained about in communities is that, how are we expected to wash our hands? Um, when we don't have access to water, how are we supposed to, to keep ourselves clean? Because uh, those were the guidelines that we were getting from the Department of Health when we don't have uh, just normal clean running water. And people were promised that tanks would go, trucks with tanks of water would go into their communities. But things were not happening the way that they were supposed to, but they were highlighting um, issues of a, a, a previous apartheid government, but also issues of our own democratic government, that in the 28 years, uh, it hasn't done what it, it was supposed to have done. The, 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 the last social dynamic that was, um, that was um, West or, or, or highlighted 
by the pandemic was this culture of corruption. Um, and, 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 and I remember when the Solidarity Fund was set up, I remember I personally thinking that and, and praying silently that I hope that this that the people who are thieves in our government will not touch that money. I was so wrong. And, and, and that is one of the things that showed us that at, at the midst of a pandemic, when people were so fearful about surviving, uh, there, there were people who stole uh, uh, and, and it, it got called the COVID-19 corruption. So there the, the were people who were working who would apply for unemployment insurance uh, funds whilst they were working. Um, and and, and, and the, the, the personal protection corruption, people who just formed companies um, that they could provide the government with this, that, and that, just so that they can cash in on the millions. And that for me showed us how low we had gone as a society. And, and the pandemic just, just put it on our face. We knew that there's a lot of corruption in this country, but when it's, 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 it's like a war that was happening um, and, and you see that people didn't care, those people who were thieves still didn't care. They still stole that money. And who suffered? The poor. And, and when I say the poor, I'm starting with women and children. They are the people um, uh, that, that suffered. So I just want to come to a close just about what the pandemic changed and what um, the, 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 you know, the, the positives and the negatives. The way, of course, uh, things that we became aware of in communities that um, we have lost this as communities and had we had uh, these movements and structures that were there during the apartheid era, uh, such as the street committees, uh, the, the civic movements uh, that, that used to be there uh, fighting this one enemy in the apartheid government, uh, one could see that this time around, uh, there is this disconnection. It, it highlighted that we have also become a people who are very inward, inward focused and individual, individualistic. And, 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 and that was, was, was a, a sad thing to be aware of that we can no longer uh, share the responsibility of taking care of one another. We have, we have looked to our government for everything. Uh, but having said that, we also saw a lot of civil society movements that got strengthened um, during this pandemic where you know, voices came together, especially from NGOs who do advocacy work on behalf of, of, of the poor, on behalf of women, um, people who made sure that the, the, the government was held to account and fighting for the human rights of women and children. The other thing that personally and as a Sophia Town team that we experienced and that we, we felt great about was the highlight of the me mental health issues. People couldn't uh, avoid talking about their fears anymore. People couldn't shelve what was troubling them anymore. So mental health issues became very, very important. Whereas uh, previously they were there, but people would be like, no, I will just step out, uh, 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 snap out of depression. But this time around, we saw an increase in in, in cases of depression, cases of anxiety, panic attacks. And those were spoken about not only in, in counseling rooms, but also in the media, but also uh, with the guidelines, you know, of how to take care of yourself. So that became an important uh, uh, highlight for us 
because we are in the space and we are always encouraging people that our mental health is important. So the, the pandemic also changed us in that way, that we became a people who are more open to talking about our anger, our fears, our triggers, our anxiety, and, and our traumatic bereavement, because I believe that the other fear that we still have is that we haven't processed our, our, our what, do I, what can I call it, our national grief, because so many people died and so many people were buried in ways that were not healing to us and buried in ways that were unusual to us where we were allocated numbers, only so many people can go to a funeral. And the rituals that are normally done by African families were not done. So one of the fears that we still have is that, are we ever going to get to a stage where we process our traumatic bereavement as a nation? Uh, and this lies on top of the previous trauma that we are dragging around as a nation where we haven't really healed from the past of a, 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 a government that was racist and a government that uh, divided people according to you know, their race. So that, that, that is also still a, a fear um, that how are we ever going to get into that psychologically uh, as a nation um, because the, the, the storm is not over. We, we keep adapting um, to this turbulent uh, 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 pandemic that, that we are going through. Um, so, so, so those were some of the, the, the thoughts that I had. And then in conclusion, I, I, I looked at some of the, I would not say that they were bad, some of the guidelines that we were given by the government um, and simple guidelines on how we can protect ourselves. And I thought about the women uh, that we work with, how they would answer to the government when they, they hear about these guidelines. A, a simple thing such as wash your hands. I thought that you know a woman in one of the areas that we work with might just say, I'm afraid I have never had any running water. When we are told sanitize your hands, they might say, I'm afraid I can't afford to even buy bread for my children. And therefore, how do I buy a sanitizer? When they say social distance will keep, social distancing will keep you safe. That woman might say, I'm afraid the cheapest form of transport to collect my grant to pick up my ARVs if, if I'm living with HIV at the public hospital, I'm afraid the only transport that I can afford is a taxi and there's no social distancing there and we are packed. Uh, and so, I will not be able to social distance. That stay at home and home is your safest, safest place against the, against the virus. I, I, I imagined that woman that I was talking about who's a community health worker saying, I'm afraid my home became the most dangerous place uh, living with an abusive man. There was no safety in my home. I'm afraid when I stay at home all day, somebody else might say, I can't go and get at least one meal for my children to be alive. And then when they say quarantine, when you have symptoms of the virus, I thought that the women would say, I'm afraid we are a family of eight living in one room and it is impossible to quarantine. Even when I have found out that I, am, I, I, am, I have tested positive with the virus. And finally, they said children should stay at home and classes will be offered online. I spoke about this. A woman might say, I'm afraid I have no smartphone. I can't even afford food. I can't even afford the basic phone, what the young people call a dump phone. And even if I did, I wouldn't be able to afford airtime or data. 
And then the last thing, for stress relief, we were advised we must exercise, we, might, we must eat healthy, especially during the first uh, hard lockdown. I imagined one of the women that we work with saying, I'm afraid, whatever we get to eat, we eat. It is not about nutrition. It is about having something to eat. So I'll just stop on that note because I feel like I, I've spoken too much <laughs> and give Usha an opportunity maybe to have a discussion. Thank you very much, Pumi. Unfortunately, in the digital space, it's so hard to, to clap hands for a presentation <laughs> of, or get feedback. I just wanted to maybe follow up because um, I think it's quite hard what you're telling us, but I also know that um, that also what you do and what the Firetown, the organization does, but also many other, you mentioned the civil society organizations that uh, even under these extremely difficult conditions that you were really fighting hard to defend the collectives, to, to find collective spaces, to also organize yourself, to, to support each other, to, um, to organize networks of women to deal with the situation and, and find some ways of caring for the carers or caring for yourself in that, in that context. And I know that you have not been passive just looking at it, but you were extremely creative to, to just try and work, make, find, make plans around it. And, and of course, also deal with your anger and yeah, what, and approach uh, those who, who, who cause part of it. So I, I would actually like to ask you if you could also share a little bit this side of your work mm -hmm. um so um yeah so that we understand a bit better how how do people actually now react and deal in this how do they act mm -hmm. in this context and what did you do mm -hmm. it's an organization yeah. group yeah Th thank you Ushe. um the first thing that we did was that we <clears throat> we we fought uh, to stay in people's lives. Um, and, 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 and at that first phase where we were not allowed to go anywhere, where we were in, in, working from home, we, we, had, um, we were given um, that time, air time to call and to connect uh, hard as it was or to WhatsApp our clients. And, and, and that, because people were so isolated and so afraid when they just hear that familiar voice and that voice that is simply checking on them and then listening. Even when you are helpless, you know that half of the things you cannot uh, do anything about it at that moment, but we listen. And we also had um, a, 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 an opportunity, uh, limited as it was, of now uh, making plans, especially for long-term clients that um, we call it here in South Africa, e-wallet. So that they 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 are given some some money to go buy groceries, and then they access the the money from their phone. Um, those that had some some you know those that had a phone. So at that time, that was presence was very important. When we were opened, when we were in level four, we 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 said we will see clients face to face. We, we, we just, there was something wrong about seeing clients over Zoom because they don't even have um, a, a, a gadget for us to connect that way. So we connected with clients and even though it was minimal, clients that we could open for, 
And then what we did, we strategized around the counseling part that we will not be going back to maybe the issues that the client had brought two years back, but we will be immediate in our approach. We will be like, what is your stress right now? And how can we give you practical support? When I say practical support, I mean practical ideas on how you can manage yourself around soaring souls, driving you crazy. And when then it was the next level, it's almost as if it was like a steps of, 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 of opening spaces for our clients where we could work with them in groups. Instead of 20, 20 people in a group, we then uh, had six at a time and then they would rotate in how they would, they would come to the sessions. And then the focus of the groups was also on self-care. It was also on, 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 on stress and how to manage yourself, just daily management. We, we were not ambitious. We, we just thought that people just need to be given support to, to go through this moment, to go through this day. And then of course the power in groups is when people realize that I'm not the only one. Even if there were six uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a session, I am not the only one. And then people are sharing tips, people are sharing uh, coping mechanisms. In the communities where I work, I also then became aware that people are dying so much and the added stress on women is a lack of planning around death and, and around what needs to happen. And we started having sessions just around, uh, we, we used to call it a red file, a red file that each woman should have with their ID copy, with uh, whatever uh, life cover they have, because I am fortunate to work with people who have some form of income, they work, they are community health workers. So we started like um, becoming very practical um, to, to be able to say, can you talk to someone if anything happens to you, this is where your red file will be. Even if it wasn't red, we just called it a red file that they would communicate with someone, their child, their eldest child, so that there is no added stress for children not knowing what to do if, God forbid, anything happens to their parent. So we, we were very practical in our approach. And we also uh, used the group to support, uh, you know, for, for them to be a support system uh, uh, for each other. And, and just having five other people around, you know, you and you have been away and disconnected from people, it, it, it reduced um, the, 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 the fears uh, that people had. So we, we designed or we structured our group sessions in such a way that they are about self-care, they are about surviving this day, surviving the week, they are about sharing ideas, and they are also about normalizing the fear um, for people to find the freedom in sitting through the fear and saying, um, it, it is okay. Because people kept wanting the old, we can't wait for this thing to pass so that we can get back to our old life. And, and we had to talk a lot about how do we deal with our fears of what we don't know and also support one another in the fears of what we don't know, but also adapt um, because there is no going back to our old life. And at first that was very, very scary for people. Um, so so, so we, 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 we were moving, as the president was moving us that now you are in lockdown level four, so such activities can happen. We would have our own uh, uh, sort of like mini strategic plan to say, what does that mean to us? What is it that we can do with the space that we have been given right up until um, we were allowed more and more and more freedom. Um, uh, but we made sure, like for, for example, uh, 
what I still think was a brilliant idea for our community workers. They started checking by phone and WhatsApp, which is difficult because their clients don't have phones. Then the next level, we did what we called gate visits. So they would go stand at the gate of the clients with a mask and the client is in their yard and they would do a quick check in. And just for them seeing the community workers that they are here, they came all the way to check on us, would also be, I would say, therapeutic in itself. And then when we were opened a, a further, we did yard visits. So yard visits, they were not getting inside the house and we chose those clients that were not high risk, clients who had not been hospitalized um, and they visited them and sat with them in the, uh, 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 in the yard, socially distanced. And so we moved that up until uh, when we got to level one, when, when they could, um, pop in the house a bit. Uh, for us, it felt like this is better than, you know, just checking on people telephonically. Um, and, and as things like the vaccine started, we added that into our programs that we, we need to talk about the vaccines, the fears, the education, the myths that people are having, whatever maybe the pastor was saying at church and people were saying, this is what my pastor is saying at church. And then we would talk about that. So we were very present and immediate. Um, and, 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 and we felt that that is moving to, according to what the clients are needing or the communities are needing at that time. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like even under these difficult conditions, the power of solidarity and of networks is, is quite strong, but it must have been a, a huge effort to do that, you know, as, mm. as community organizers, as, as staff. Mm. I'm just wondering, I see there are a few questions in, in the chat, so um, I, I would like to just hand over to Lucia now to just uh, um, tell us what are the questions and then maybe we can include those questions in the discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, vielen Dank. Um, also ein Teil der Fragen, um, Many things. So a part of the questions. Osha, you integrated yourself already and Pumi, you have already answered a part of the questions. So for example, what were reactions to the circumstances, to the lockdown. There was the question if there was not a great deal of anger that came up, especially with within those concerned, especially the women. Then there was two very practical questions concerning your work. For once, what recent developments in your work would be with the Omicron variant? And about your thoughts, Mpumi, concerning how many women and families you reach with your work and what problems arise, especially concerning domestic violence, if there's a big uh, impediment of just reaching out for help. So the question would have been probably how you dealt with that aspect of domestic violence. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the problem of of domestic violence and 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 femicide and and all these horrors against women. These are problems that even before the pandemic, we've had to uh, counsel women, offer support to women, 
help women with risk assessment. When I say risk assessment, like to 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 help them to have a a plan on how safely how safe is it to be able to you know to get support from the extended family or from other supportive systems i mean that 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 is something that we have that is our approach normally when we are working with with, with women who are in um and and most of the time it is emotional um emotional abuse uh, that we 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 would be um you know, supporting women around there. What what was happening with those people who were really struggling in, in, in the lockdown was that they couldn't access the family. This one uh, a, a, a client I keep going back to, she, she was able to speak to the mom and speak you know, to say, I want to come home. I can simply uh, go to work and, and then pack a bag, leave the house as if I'm going to work and, and then after work, come home. And, and I supported that because um, I was checking on her on a daily basis. And once again, it is sad to say this, but sometimes the, the, the issues of, of, of patriarchy, the, the, the perpetrators of patriarchy are also women. Because I remember being so furious when she told me the mother said, this guy must just pay a fine uh, because he had paid Lobola, I don't know how to, how to interpret Lobola in English, but it's that dowry payment um, that a man does to the woman's family to to, uh, communicate their intentions of marrying and, 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 and culturally they become like they are now a husband, even if uh, they haven't married uh, formally according to the Western laws. So the, the, the mom had said, it's fine, you can come home. And I was relieved. She went home for one night. And then they had this long conversation. And she said, no, um, she, he must just pay this 500 rands um, for treating you in this way. Uh, and, and, and yeah, it, 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 it leaves you with this helplessness because this woman is working, working in a particular area. You cannot even say, oh, there's plenty of um, shelters for abused women in that, in that area. Uh, so we are also under-resourced. So we work with very limited resources, which is very frustrating. Um, but I've just written, we've just written our final report, end of year reports in our various projects. And I, I, I had a little, um, you know, uh, emotional moment when I was writing about her journey that when I, when, when the country fully opened up and I could see them, the first thing she told me is that she, she left and she lives in a new area. Uh, she left him and she lives in a new area and, um, and, and sometimes in our work, we don't see results immediately because we work in a very deep and intimate way with people, um, which can sometimes be very frustrating and frightening to us because you are afraid, whether for a woman who's hungry or a woman who has been threatened by their landlord that they are going to be kicked out uh, uh, because they haven't paid their rent, and this is this is often a, a an experience of our uh, Sophia Town East colleagues that work a lot with women from from African um, countries. So 
that is is very difficult because we have to sit through not knowing and sit and take on the fears of our clients. Um, but we have that principle that we will never leave or abandon them. We, we will always be there for them. But there are no easy solutions and no immediate solutions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think I see there are also more questions and I think it's also about the issue of how to connect what you do um, in, I mean, in your day to day work with the people and to broader um, political struggles around femicides, around fighting gender based violence, about uh, better conditions for community health workers. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I want to just give Lucien another round to to summarize the questions who came in now so that maybe we can move to another round of responses from you uh, and connecting to what um, Rita said earlier. I don't think the losing control is the issue that is already gone, but mm -hmm. the issue is about uh, what, uh, how can, I mean, what does it expose the situation? You said the pandemic exposes and how can it be changed? Yeah. Lucian? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of questions coming in at the moment. I'll pick one. One about the possible reactiv reactivation of um, traumatic experiences in the South African context. Uh, you were talking about the red files. Lucien was asked to talk a little slower. And now is dealing with a technical problem. The person writes, this reminds me of the HIV AIDS situation in the early 2000s in South Africa, when many young adults died and children were left in the care of grandparents or other relatives or all alone. The question is, is this comparable to the situation in the last two years in South Africa with those who died of COVID-19? Okay. I think there are certain um, parallels um, during that time where where it was overwhelming um, the, the number of deaths and the, the burdens that were left with the children. And the, the support that we give is very important in also linking people with other uh, with, 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 with other support structures and with other organizations that can take on, um, who, who, who do advocacy work or it, it's just that sometimes the resources are, are thin, the resources are limited, but in terms of families um, being able to, to support one another, uh, or to support the children or to support uh, those that are vulnerable that are left behind. Uh, I think the principle needs to be the same um, that we, we, those that we work with whilst they are alive because COVID-19 has also traumatized us in that way that someone would be alive this week and then next week they are gone. Whilst they are alive, we do these sessions on how to be prepared. And, and, and I know it sounds horrible to, to, to say how to be prepared. Rita spoke about uh, you guys as Europeans, you love planning, you love being prepared. 
And sometimes us as Africans, we, we just live organically at, at times. Um, and, and I mean, that's a, a generalization, but sometimes we, we can be a bit laid back and we can have certain beliefs that talking about death once you are alive too much, it's bad luck on you. So we have had to plan these sessions in such a, 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 a creative way. I remember that that session when we talk about preparing for your own death and preparing your family and preparing uh, who's going to take your kids, who's going to do what. I just don't start it like that. I started with an activity where I say people must just reflect on their journals if I was not here, and then dot, dot, dot. And then they start writing, if I was not here, so-and-so wouldn't be able to get groceries, so-and-so wouldn't be able, my sister's child wouldn't, wouldn't go to school. And then I show them their value, you know, that how valuable they are. And then, I, then we talk about the gap that will be left if anything had to happen to you. So one of the things that is important is to then um, organize family or connect with those people in the family that are supportive towards you so that they can step in. I, I hope I'm making sense, uh, but it's not a matter of, oh yeah, I, do you have a policy? Do you have this and that and that? But that in itself is trying to um, intervene in this whole, the adults, the breadwinner has passed on and, you know, nobody has planned about the kids. Nobody has spoken about the kids. Who's going to take care of the kids? Who's going to ensure that they continue with their education? So those are the things that we try because we have micro uh, focused organizations. We work with individuals, smaller groups of people, and in communities, but not in macro uh, contexts. We, 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 we try our best that where we can influence change, we start planting seeds still in a therapeutic way because we've got uh, an ethical responsibility, uh, but also link people, you know, the community workers, I've worked with about 30 community health workers for the last year and about eight nurses uh, from a clinic. But the community workers that I've worked with, when I started working with them, they never thought about having a will. But that becomes part of the education. And, and, and they said, no, we thought wills are for rich people. Um, but they are adding an income. They've got an RTP house or they've built a two-room house. And I, I, it's important to educate who uh, do you want to be in charge of your two-room house or your two-room uh, space when, when you are gone. And by the end of the year, about 70% of them have got wills. They, they, and they thought it's expensive. So that education as well, so that things are not happening the way they used to during the, that time when, when HIV deaths were so rife, um, that we also need to be thinking proactively. Um, and and I, I, I keep claiming my own privilege uh, in my work that the program that I am in is a program where I work with people who have some form of an income which makes a huge difference from my colleagues who might be working with people who don't have any source of income. Thank you very much. I think there is still uh, some more questions, but I think um, around Omicron and also what you do against this gender-based violence, I know there have been a lot of protests a few years ago against femicide, against gender-based violence, if that has re-emerged or if people are organizing around that. But I would like to suggest that we we keep that and then hand over to Julia to list that she introduces us to another video from Rita. And then later we can come back again and discuss what we have heard from Rita. 
and maybe include that other questions. So there is still some time, so you can add in the chat more questions, but at the moment I would want to hand over to Julia again. Thank you. Yeah, vielen Dank to me for for this input and thank you very much, Pumi, for your input and for highlighting the creative possibilities or interventions. For example, you did uh, gate visits in the light of the harshness of the situation. This is a very creative way of going about things and of how to approach the topic of death, which is normally an impossibility. Rita also talks a lot about death, but from a quite a different perspective, from the perspective of indigenous people in Latin America. And I realized this. So Rita was talking about suicide as a form of uh, removing yourself from all of this struggle. And even though you speak from very different perspectives, you come back to similar topics and your positions within the society is also made visible in the next video clip from uh, Rita. Of course, we did ask her, what, what do you think about uh, fear as a dynamic in the pandemic? And uh, she started with a very personal answer before uh, being more concrete with regards to conspiracy theories. And I would like to hand the word back to you, Mpumi, afterwards, uh, because in South Africa, as in Germany, there are dynamics in that direction, which we cannot deny. So now, Rita, sorry, I can't. That depends very much on the person. So fear and caution are signs of intelligence. So maybe I should have had a little more fear. The pandemic evoked very little fear in me. So friends who have my age, who are my age, I am 70 years old. I had the impression that they were much more afraid than I was. I don't know why, maybe I'm a bit stupid too, or just maybe I'm too busy to be afraid because my friends work less, so they have fewer commitments. So they have a lot of fear and they are very careful. So the pandemic has go been going on for two years now and I still forget to take my mask when I go outdoors. I don't understand why. It shouldn't be like that. But there is just differences from person to person. There's many people who are much more aware of how vulnerable they are and others less so. And there is a variety of reasons of reactions to the situation we find ourselves in. I'm quite sure about that. Do you think anything will change with the new Omicron variant? I actually have a question myself. Omicron is spreading faster than any other variant yet. But it does not seem as deadly, which means that it doesn't cause as much damage as other variants, or that's what we assume up until now. We do not know how it will develop in the future. But up until now, Omicron is spreading very quickly. It's very contagious, but it has not caused as many deaths. Yet. But something I do not understand, and I'll elaborate a bit on this point. In the late 19th century, there was what is known as the vaccination revolt in Brazil. So they tried, or the government wanted to vaccinate the black population against smallpox. I am not exactly sure about the dates and the vaccinations, but I, I think it was the vaccination against smallpox. In any case, there was a revolt among the black population who did not trust and who did not want to get vaccinated, which is perfectly understandable. They were afraid they were going to be exterminated. So after such an extensive genocide and the enslavement 
that their ancestors had gone through meant they just lacked confidence into the state and into healthcare. What I do not understand, what I cannot understand is how in Germany, a country that you can call the cradle of science, so many people react in the same way as the black population of Brazil who had just survived enslavement. So the same, they show the same reaction. I just can't understand that, how that can happen in a country where science plays such an important role. How can there be such a great distrust of science? There has been so many inventions in Germany. I can remember giving a lecture at Humboldt University in Berlin and in the main forum of the university, there is a gallery of rectors painting. <laughs> when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. So this is the land of science. Science is in Germany. We're not talking about people who have just survived enslavement and who are afraid of a genocidal state trying to exterminate them or vaccination being veritable poison. So why does this exactly take place in Germany? So this question Dita asked us, so this incomprehension of how that can happen people who go to the who take to the streets against vaccines because the state wants to wants to make them uh, harmless or kill them by vaccinating them she passed on this question to us and yesterday we talked about the german circumstances yet here we don't want to talk that much about conspiracy theory uh, theorists in germany but we want to hand the floor back to Mpumi and ask about the situation in South Africa. Yet what I want to highlight, what Rita mentioned and what tends to be forgotten is that both those movements against vac vaccinations, one or like one being in Brazil, in a society of formerly enslaved black people with a very understandable fear because medical knowledge is based on the exploitations of the bodies of black people um, versus, on the other hand, which is what Rita does not understand, other groups having profited from science, having led this, these experiments, how can this group develop a similar relation, a similar stand towards the vaccinations. So this legitimate fear and the fear of exploitation of our bodies is something very interesting. So now Pumi, maybe you can come back to how it's like in South Africa. What are the dynamics? What are the fears? One could say that it's a reaction against fear. Thanks, Julia. Um, we are having our own challenges um, with the the um, the government having set out their own um, uh, the numbers that they would love to to be vaccinated by the end of the year and not getting there yet. I think they have. Uh, set themselves a target of 30 million by the end of the year. We are 20 something million people, but also we also have people who have not got back. They keep um, having these drives to encourage people to go back for their second jabs. It ranges from religious people uh, stating that they've got religious reasons, uh, why they are not doing it, uh, to um, I've heard also of uh, men in, 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 in rural areas saying that 
I don't know where they got it, but saying that um, they've got a belief that if they get vaccinated, it will affect their fertility and they can't play around with that. And also the power of, of, of religious leaders, because some have, uh, who, who are more fundamentalists have spoken against it. Um, and, 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 and people uh, who are very religious, um, you know, still take their pastors or their religious leaders weird. Um, and then, of course, there are those people who um, uh, bring a lot of conspiracies about government wanting to, to control us. And even more scary, it's, it's, it's even people who are still saying there is no COVID-19. You know, it's, 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 it's a creation of some sort um, by these powerful people um, and, and that, that, that is also quite, quite scary. I think for me with the, with the Omicron and, and our fourth wave that um, we are in right now um, and the debates um, around uh, vaccinating or not vaccinating and the government, uh, they seem to be moving closer and closer to um, making it mandatory and some unions supporting that and some saying people with health reasons who will fight on your behalf, people who can't vaccinate for health reasons, but people who give all these other uh, reasons, uh, you will have to vaccinate. I think the, the, the fear that we have is that it, it is it is going to cause divisions. And we are in a place where laborers or lower paid workers or people without a voice under normal circumstances go through so much oppression and discrimination. And it might be used uh, in a way that is abusing them, that the fact that this, this person is not vaccinated, um, it might be used um, to, I don't know how to put it, but to discriminate further. And, and we are a people who are so sensitive to being discriminated uh, against. So it, it, it might bring a dynamic where there's a lot of fights. And yet on one hand, we are being told we are, we are being told by the health department that the, the ICUs are not under pressure as they were in the, in the Delta, uh, uh, during the Delta uh, variant. The hospitals are not as, so, so therefore we are being encouraged. Uh, those people who have vaccinated are being, are, are, are being oh, yeah, it is being said that it's early days, but it seems as if vaccinating does help. You know, so you can you can see this one end that you you wish people could just all people would wake up and in a perfect world they'll be like, this is for our own good. This is for us to uh, continue with life in this new way but find our rhythm because psychologically it helps when we have found our rhythm, even if we are not going back to our old uh, life, but psychologically there's something that feels safe about just knowing that, you know, this is what I have to do. Then these are the non-pharmaceutical uh, 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 things that I have to do to keep myself and others safe. And, and, that, that brings an element of safety psychologically. Um, but it's not, it's not happening like that because of all the challenges and all the, the misinformation and, and the social media uh, misinformation is also not helpful. But I am personally thinking that next year we are going to be faced with challenges of employers 
um, especially in these uh, capitalist uh, big um, corporates and in, in environments where people are just seen as machines to make sure that we get profits, you know, uh, they are not going to be handling it in a way that, in a, in a humane way to find out what is really your fear, what, is, what, what are your challenges, why are you so afraid of vaccinating, it's just going to be, you must just do it, you know, and if you don't, you're going to lose your job, and that is going to cause problems, because even in the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we saw people losing jobs, but when you find out how the process of losing that job was done. Sometimes you pick up that um, COVID-19 became an excuse for certain employers, not for everybody, of course, and how it was done. It was done so insensitively for some people via an SMS um, or just being told that that's it, you know. Um, and that in itself is just brutal. Um, and and that, that, that is also quite, quite scary. I think for me with the, with the Omicron and, and our fourth wave that um, we are in right now um, and the debates um, around uh, vaccinating or not vaccinating and the government, uh, they seem to be moving closer and closer to um, making it mandatory and some unions supporting that, and some saying people with health reasons who will fight on your behalf, people who can't vaccinate for health reasons, but people who give all these other uh, reasons, uh, you will have to vaccinate. I think the, the, the fear that we have is that it, it, is, it is going to cause divisions. And we are in a place where laborers or lower paid workers or people without a voice under normal circumstances go through so much oppression and discrimination. And it might be used uh, in a way that is abusing them, that the fact that this, this person is not vaccinated, um, it, it might be used um, to I don't know how to put it, but to discriminate further. And, and we are a people who are so sensitive to being discriminated uh, against. So it, it, it might bring a dynamic where there's a lot of fights. And yet on one hand, we are being told, we are, we are being told by the health department that the, the ICUs are not under pressure as they were in the in the Delta uh, uh, during the Delta uh, variant, the hospitals are not as so. So therefore, we are being encouraged. Uh, those people who have vaccinated are being are, are, are being. Oh, yeah, it, it is being said that it's early days, but it seems as if vaccinating does help. You know, so you can you can see this one and that you you wish people could just all people would wake up and in a perfect world they'll be like this is for our own good this is for us to uh continue with life in this new way but find our rhythm because psychologically it helps when we have found our rhythm even if we are not going back to our old uh life but psychologically there's something that feels safe about just knowing that, you know, this is what I have to do, then these are the non-pharmaceutical uh, 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 things that I have to do to keep myself and others safe. And, and that, that brings an element of safety psychologically. Um, but it's not, it's not happening like that because of all the challenges and all the the misinformation and the social media uh, misinformation is also not helpful. But I am personally thinking that next year we are going to be faced 
with challenges of employers, uh, um, especially in these uh, capitalist uh, big um, corporates and in, in environments where people are just seen as machines to make sure that we get profits, you know, uh, they are not going to be handling it in a way that, in a, in a humane way to find out what is really your fear, what, is, what, what are your challenges, why are you so afraid of vaccinating? It's just gonna be, you must just do it, you know, and if you don't, you're gonna lose your job. And that is going to cause problems because even in the uh, beginning of the pandemic, we saw people losing jobs, but when you find out how the process of losing that job was done. Sometimes you pick up that um, COVID-19 became an excuse for certain employers, not for everybody, of course, and how it was done. It was done so insensitively for some people via an SMS um, or just being told that that's it, you know. Um, and that in itself is just brutal. Um, thank you very much for this response. We thought that perhaps Usha and you and Pumi could continue discussing this topic further because Usha was in South Africa uh, a brief while ago. Perhaps you would like to add something yourself regarding deterring protests and fears in your own words. Yes, what I thought of in regard to what Rita mentioned of course, it's a huge discussion here in Germany. What is the motivation which lies behind the disturbing disseminants of conspiracy theory and the, and the respective protests on the streets? The protests which uh, are against the the measures concerning COVID, and they come up with the most irrational explanations for what is happening at the moment. And to what extent is this related to dynamics of trying to deal with your fear of fear repression? And of course, there are psychoanalytical perspectives, which state that if you cannot deal with your fear internally, then you project this fear on another object, something else, you come fall back to conspiracy theories to deal with your fear, because then you see yourself standing on the side of those who know what everything is about, what this is about, and still this fear abates it but at the same time moves these people into a space which has its own inner dynamics, namely those conspiracy narratives. Others say this is a psychological interpretation of these mechanisms to suppress fear or deal with fear, and it is not at all it's not, it's, it's not enough and ignores political constellations, power structures, which lead to the fact that these conspiracy theories can spread to the extent they do via uh, social media, but also explicitly furthered by right-wing groups who are interested in furthering those uh, narratives. And I realized that in South Africa, in also via the social media, there are similar conspiracy theories. Oh, did you leave the meeting, Pumi? No, there you are. And I was astounded, whilst at the same time these conspiracy narratives had an anti-apartheid, anti-racist, so to name it, um, narrative, it is the white, who the white people who uh, came up with the coronavirus um, experiments are being 
carried out with black bodies, the idea which Rita also mentioned. And so political parties and the groupings mobilize via this, also racist, xenophobe dynamics are created via those conspiracy theories. And I imagine what how this is interlinked, how the conspiracy theories link with the respective national and right-wing interests. I'm not sure what your point of view is regarding this, Mpumi. Perhaps, Mpumi, we could pass this question to you. Uh, looking at the chat, uh, people were uh, very eager to state their perspectives or ask questions regarding Germany. And I would add a second question. I do hope you are still in the meeting. You disappeared from my screen. So as a second question, I would like to add, how do you perceive these dynamics in Germany from your po vantage point in South Africa? And of course, the question Usha posed previously. Okay, I think what I liked about what Uche was saying about projection, um, I like the fact that I like what she was saying because I wish, uh, as 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 a clinician and and as a clinical social worker, as a counselor, um, I. I wish that we could have opportunities with people on a one-to-one -one basis where we listen to the fears, we listen to the projections, you know, and, and we, we, we listen with care, we listen with, with uh, empathy, um, because empathy doesn't mean that I understand that it sounds crazy. <laughs> it just means that I am getting into your world and I keep asking questions and more questions to, to help me to understand your perspective. What I have picked up from all the debates that happen that I have listened to here in South Africa is that it becomes so divided uh, both sides become so loud. And for me, as a person who works psychologically with people, um, that, uh, that doesn't help. I, 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 just, I, just, I just wish that even those people who uh, have ideas that sound far-fetched uh, could allow themselves um, to sit with someone and just say, let me tell you, this is what I'm scared of. Maybe they're not even aware that they are scared of something, um, but if they had somebody to mirror it to them and ask them the question, what are you afraid of? I can hear all the reasons that you don't want to do this. What is your one fear about this vaccine? And then from that, the fear, and not necessarily about according to this, according to that video, according to that tweet, but we talk about your fear, we personalize it. So, and I mean, that's just a, that's just a fantasy of a person who works psychologically with people. Um, because you know, when such debates happen, they happen on a larger scale, people, go on marches and they are so attached to the way that they, their perspective and they really believe what they believe. So it's, it's difficult to, I mean, how would you get that to translate into one-on-one -on -one discussions that are calm, that are acknowledging the fear um, that are saying fear is a normal human behavior. Um, um, it, 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 it's, it's a very difficult one. However, with the people that I often say when I get overwhelmed, I focus on what can I influence. With the people that 
I work with, that people that I can engage uh, that intimately, um, it, it's a possibility always to, to, to talk about those fears. And, and as, as Sophia Town, we put together a simple uh, um, um, brochure on vaccines and myths and facts. And, and we took the position of this is what the people who are studying, <laughs> who, whose work is to study this, are telling us. And for now, we believe them as an organization. We're taking the stand that we will believe what these scientists are saying. Um, and, and, and when we engage with clients or community members with that pamphlet, that is when we have opportunities to ask, okay, your pastor said this, your religious leader said that, the WhatsApp message said this, but what are you scared of? Let's talk about your fears. Uh, it, with regards to the, 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 the German yeah. uh, uh, context, um, I apologize to all of you uh, German citizens. I haven't been following uh, uh, the, the debates that side. I've been following the ones this, 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 this side. I haven't been following them. Um, so I am not... Um, at liberty to, to, to comment about any of them. Das ist sehr diplomatisch, vielen Dank. Um, und in jedem Fall ist es natürlich auch... That's very diplomatic of you, thanks very much. And in a way it is a kind of decentering Europe to know, you know, Germany is not the one and only thing people focus on. Thank you very much for your response. And I was very interested in how you scaled the different levels, that of the individual and that of the social movement, which takes to the streets. And but rather to focus on putting energy where I am able to move things, to make a change. Um, I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time left. I would like to ask you, Pumi, uh, what does your schedule look like? Would you like to leave at H sharp, um, CT, H yeah, sharp, I'm, or I'm can okay. we, uh, okay. would you like to stay with us yeah. for some time? Yeah. yeah. In that case, I would like to ask Lucien. There was a lot of discussion in the chat, which maybe you followed. If there are questions apart from conspiracy narratives, maybe Lucien, you can focus on those. And maybe I'd like to allow Rita to say some more words, but um, first of all, what questions have been collected in the chat. Pumi, there's also a comment in the chat. Thank you very much for your response. And the person who wrote this says, this perspective is very helpful also from a German point of view. So from the chat, there were many smaller questions, many comments. There was also a very specific interest to get to know more about the work of Sophia Town. So on the one hand, it truly sounds as if Sophia Town had to dig really deep in terms of supporting their clients, especially when they had to stick to their core business while the major need of the clients is food. How has this impacted on Sophia Town's employees, staff, and how has the organization so continued to support them? And how can the organization itself be supported from other sources, resources? Would you like to answer directly? Okay. Okay. Uh, it, you can have a bit of an ad spot here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's. Um, I think Ushe has already uh, put in the our 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 website 
I think it, it, it might um, help to just to go in and, and see all the different programs that we have uh, or that we do. Um, but I wanted to, to say the issue of, of, of the tension um, between um, the social relief needs of clients and our um, core business has always been has always been our challenge, but we 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 keep going back into reminding ourselves um, um, of of who we are and 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 what is it that we we set out to do and what we are funded to to do. Um, so as much as uh, material need and material relief um, is, is often an issue and, an, and a big issue, we have also learned over the years to integrate that to be therapeutic if we have the limited means to do it and not to do it from a position of here, yeah, we give you this, go sort yourself out for the day. Um, but it is, it, it is with clients uh, that have been with us for, for a while. We, we do certain things quarterly um, uh, of you know, share, giving a voucher or buying school uniform or school shoes or, um, but it is done in a very, in a very, uh, in a way that supports the very counseling that we are doing or the very counseling process that we are doing. So it's not an easy one. It's, it's just that um, the pandemic highlighted it even more. And it felt like, you know, the other issues, I'm not going to get into the other issues. The minute you ask me, how have you been since the last time we've spoken? If we spoke last week, Wednesday, and it's this week, Wednesday, in this past seven days, tell me about your past seven days. And you just hear stories of despair and hunger. And, you know, so you, 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 you then can't be insensitive and, and say, oh, forget about that. Let's talk about you being angry with your mother-in-law, you know. Um, so there is a limited way that we can intervene in that way, but that is not who we are. We, we also are a very reflective uh, team and management team. So, and we have spaces for staff and supervision where people sit and they are able to just talk about their own despair as staff members and their own sense of guilt when I've said yes to this one and I've said no to this one because they have disappeared for a while and now that they hear that it's end of year and uh, there's going to be some vouchers that are given, they reappear in the group um, and it, it doesn't make stuff feel good, but we have those spaces where we can be able to, to to allow them to talk about it without fear of judgment and also to, to process that, to process the helplessness, to process um, the, their own despair. But also that also serves to remind us who we are. And I think if, if, if you are a reflective organization, you're very much in touch with your soul as an organization and, and, and you, you always, um, remind each other that we are not, I'll make an example, we are not the, a big, uh, great South African organization called Gift of the Givers that goes out there and does enormous work. And we remind ourselves that we are not the gift of the givers. They, they specialize in that. We are a psychosocial support organization. And once we've reminded ourselves who we are, we are able to then live with ourselves. So in terms of the support 
for staff. Staff have got weekly um, uh, supervision spaces, whether it's individual supervision or group supervision, where they are able to um, talk about this because it's, it's, it's tough. It's not an easy one. Thank you so much for this elaboration on your work. When I asked you how long you could go on, I forgot to ask the interpreters how long for how long they can stay with us. So I have I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how to interpret. Uh, So I'll, um, I might skip, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe let's attach the video to the recording of this session of which we will upload. And Pumi, if you'd like, we would like to give you the opportunity for a closing statement. We thought we would like to ask you what practices you would deem most necessary. So what steps could be taken or what would be the most important uh, thing in all the interventions you have and you do against aggression, against fear and against the suppression of fear. So what is your favorite measure? I glaube, Pumi, du bist um, gerade, you're muted. Du bist auf Sturm geschaltet. Okay. All right. Um, I think for me, the, I don't think that one can, it's easy for anyone to own their fears because we, before you process your fears, you need to own them. You need to be aware, identify them and then own them. That these are my fears and then have a safe, outlet where you can be able to have someone to to normalize what you're going through acknowledge what you're going through even as being acknowledged as a human species that it's okay you know uh it's it's it's, it's healthy for 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 human beings to be told that you're going through something that you've never went through in your lives and it's 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 okay to have these these fears so i think that relationships that are safe are important and i think that's what we tried our best to consistently maintain in our work that we should not disappear and we should offer uh, the relationship, whether it's 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 via a telephone call, and then we open up, we open up until where we are now. Just you know, as we are about to close our centers this coming week, um, but but the relationship and then the consistency, um, because that then that opens up the process of. I acknowledge my fear. I, I talk about my fear. Mm -hmm. And I also am made to feel like I am not going crazy. I remember the time when everything started and all of us who have got the privilege of, you can work from home, you can connect. I remember us trying so hard to, to do a lot, you know? And then when you would uh, read or get some messages about how to manage your stress, 
at that time, you realize that, uh, oh, I'm not the only one, you know, who's trying to make myself like I'm still productive. I'm still productive, even if there is Corona. So that, that in itself was helpful just to be told that somebody else in, 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 in Ghana is going through what you're going through or somebody else in the US is going through what you're going through. And then it felt like, okay, I can breathe. You know, uh, it's not me being lazy. It's just the fear in me trying to yeah. um, and, and proving a point that I am still functional. I'm not going to be allowing an invisible virus to stop me. And, and I mean, in a way, it did stop us. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know whether I'm answering you today, but I think relationship, consistency, and allowing that safe space and not expecting uh, people to own their fears immediately. People will cover up and, and say and do all and say all sorts of things and, and cover up because fear goes together with being vulnerable. And a lot of people haven't been socialized to be okay with being vulnerable. Um, so it's very difficult to just own your fears because yeah. the minute I say to you, I'm scared, the minute uh, uh, um, in our context, um, an African man says to you, I'm scared, you'll be like, excuse me, if you were scared, then what about me and the kids, you know? And it's okay for men to also say, I I'm scared. I don't know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Vielen Dank. Damit hast du tatsächlich schon viele, viele Punkte auch berührt. Thank you so much. You have already touched on so many points that have been mentioned earlier. Because two sessions ago, Vanessa Thompson talked about breathing and the impossibility and the possibility of breathing and the racist making impossible to breathe and the defense of creating spaces to breathe and creating relations that make it possible also on a psychological level to not get crazy in this mm. pandemic. I would like to capture that mm. from today and to take it into the coming session in the coming year, <laughs> on the 17th of January, with Cynthia Aruza and Clemencia Curia, who you know, Pumi, where we'll talk about care mm. and care against exploitation. Yeah. So thank you for your input, for the insight into your work. Thank you, Usche. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you, Enterprise Collective, Andrea, Ralf, Lucian, behind the scenes. Thanks to everyone who stayed who asked all of those questions in the chat. All of you have a good evening Thank and you see you much. soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.